Um, well, again, my name is Dmitro Shevchenko. I'm presenting the evolution of XDB and XConnect and the underlying mechanics of, well, all the infrastructure, all the APIs, and some other things. <coughs> so, okay, what exactly am I going to present? There's a word evolution in the topic, so I'll talk about that a bit. There are words XDB and XConnect, so I'll talk about those. I'll show you the changes in Sidecore infrastructure across generations. I'll talk about concurrency control, and I'll compare the old APIs and the new APIs. So what is evolution and why am I talking about it? Well, for one, it's been a hot topic recently, and by recently I mean the last three billion years. And secondly, I think it's a pretty good metaphor, both for um, gradual and for radical changes in uh, software products. So evolution is change in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. So that's the biological side of it. But this metaphor can be applied to software as well. Um, I can draw some parallels for you. In Darwinian evolution, you have species. In software evolution, you have major releases that are supposed to be very different from previous releases. And uh, you have generations in real life and you have internal builds in um, software development where you have genome. Um, in biology, you have code base in software. Uh, you have natural selection uh, that um, decides what survives and what doesn't. And in software, the market decides. Uh, biological organisms mutate, and so do software products by using software or source control commits. Uh, when you have a series of successful mutations, uh, you have innovation, both in biological organisms and in software. Um, yeah, this is a specialized term, punctuated equilibrium. Uh, it means that once a species is established, it will remain very similar uh, for quite a long time because there is no environment pressure to change for the species. And software products are similar in that between releases, they stay the same, they have some minor updates, but the market is not changing so rapidly uh, for them to change more often than once a year, for example. And this is why evolution uh, takes millions of years and software evolution just takes years. Uh, how do we know that evolution happened? Many things, um, well, we can observe mutations, we know about genetics, we can compare anatomy, and we have a fossil record. And in Sidecore, we also have a fossil record. Uh, the marketing platform has evolved from OMS to DMS to XDB, and now XDB is um, accessed with the new product, XConnect. So I'm going to walk you through the evolution of the marketing platform. Let's start with OMS. Uh, online Marketing Suite was released in 2009 together with Sidecore 6.1. It supported SQL Server and Oracle and it had many features that are still very relevant this day. Uh, OMS had goals, campaigns, profiles, multivariate tests, it already had personalization and 
the rule engine, and it has some reports. So when you think about it, nine years later, you still have all of these features as um, core features of the marketing platform. You can't do marketing without goals, campaigns, profiles, personalization. So it was a really good product at that time, and it became even better during the last nine years. All right, this is um, what I dug up uh, together with this fossil. Uh, these are the tables of OMS, uh, not so many, and they didn't have visits or visitors or interactions. They had session and global session. So session was um, more or less the ASP.NET session, and this is what we currently know as an online interaction. And global sessions were uh, permanent cookies in the browser, uh, which were associated with the device or with the browser. So right now we know them as devices and contacts. Okay, in 2011, uh, the digital marketing system was released. This was two years later. And they introduced engagement plans. They renamed session to visit and global session to visitor. They introduced traffic types. Uh, they introduced pattern cards. Uh, you did have profiles in OMS, but on every page where you wanted to um, change the profile, you had to set um, the profile values manually. And DMS introduced pattern cards where you can um, preset those values. There were some UI improvements and better reporting and performance. So that was a good evolutionary step. XDB was first released with 7.5 in 2014. It was a major change. It introduced a scalable collection database based on MongoDB. It introduced uh, processing servers, which were also scalable. Uh, you could even create your own aggregation logic and aggregate data the way you wanted. Visitors were split into contacts and devices, uh, which meant that any contact could uh, be associated with several devices and recognized across different channels. Um, this also was related to the notion of shared sessions, uh, which could be shared between multiple simultaneous web sessions. And experience profile in, uh, in its initial form was also available with XDB in 7.5. Okay, next came uh, Sidecore 8. It was released in 2014. And it was uh, a gradual change compared to XDB in 7.5. It introduced the new reporting interface, Experience Analytics, which was much better than the old reports. It introduced some new marketing entities like outcomes, venues, channels. Uh, key behavior cache uh, was a good performance uh, improvement technique. And you could now run uh, Cycle in CMS only mode again because in uh, Sidecore 7.5, you had to use XDB. You couldn't really turn it on. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> turn it off. Obviously, you could turn it on. And uh, Redis, a session state provider, at some point in Sidecore 8 was also introduced. OK, this brings us to Sidecore 9. So the Sidecore experience platform in 9 is the current uh, version of the platform. 
released last year. It introduced XConnect, which is another major change. It's not um, a gradual evolution of how it used to be. It's a completely different approach based on the microservice architecture. And you don't have access to, or you, you don't have the ability to host collection database in MongoDB anymore. You should be able to soon, but not right now. Everything is secure, um, both from the outside and internally between roles. Um, all connections are SSL based. Uh, Cycle is now GDPR compliant and marketing automation uh, as a UI and also internally. Um, it's been revamped. It's more usable now. It works better. So this is the current version. And I'm going to dive in into the infrastructure. Let's again um, rewind and look at the uh, infrastructure of Sitecore before OMS. Yeah, this is again still classic. It's still relevant to this day and as far as I can tell, this is how it's been since Sitecore 5 or even earlier. Uh, you had a content management cluster where you would have a master database and a core database and you could, if you needed to, uh, you could have several content management servers. And you can have multiple content delivery clusters, each of them having multiple content delivery servers and its own session state, its own web database, and data is published from master to web. Well, this is not big news to any of you, I assume. Uh, yeah, publishing was done by content management servers. When OMS was introduced, <coughs> um, they introduced uh, the analytics database. And in some cases, you could even have two. Uh, it wasn't um, the most common setup. Normally, you would only have one analytics database. You would um, have your content delivery servers raw data into the analytics database. And from the same database, you would read data uh, for your reports. But it was possible uh, to split them into two. They had the same exact schema. And the difference was that the collection part of it uh, had indexes disabled, um, which improved the speed of writes. And then overnight, data would be transferred uh, to exactly the same schema, but with indexes enabled in the reporting version of um, that database. Uh, so this is the most uh, complex setup you could have in OMS and DMS. Okay, with Sitecore 8, and actually with Sitecore 7.5, um, this is the infrastructure uh, that was improved. It was more scalable, more flexible. Uh, collection database was a MongoDB cluster, and data was written there, again, from content delivery servers, and um, you had a reporting database that was SQL based. And then the processing servers, which you could have many of, um, they would read data uh, from MongoDB, they would write data to the reporting database, and then there was a reporting service. It's optional, but <coughs> um, it was good to have it. And uh, all of the reporting queries would go through this reporting service. It would read data from the reporting database. And somewhere in Sitecore 7, um, they added uh, full server support, uh, which meant that 
your infrastructure grew in that department as well. Uh, you would have a solar clouds if you really needed great performance. And this is uh, getting a bit more complex, <coughs> but not if you compare it to the new Sitecore 9 infrastructure. And here we have some parts that stayed the same. The content management cluster, the content delivery clusters. Uh, between them, the publishing service is now available for much more performant publishing of your content. Uh, so that's one difference. Processing servers stay the same. Um, solar cloud stays the same. Well, now the collection database is again based on SQL and it's sharded. Um, sharding is not uh, something that you get out of the box with SQL Server. So Sitecore implemented their own sharding implementation. And it works on application level. I will uh, talk a bit more about it. Uh, all right, you have much more, um, much more fine-grained services. Um, XConnect and XP services um, are what you see on the left in the middle. And uh, most of the work they do, it used to be done in Sitecore 8 as well. The difference is uh, you couldn't split up those microservices before. So for example, let's take XConnect collection service. Uh, what it does, uh, it provides an API to uh, read and write data to and from the collection database. Uh, before, in that grade, uh, content delivery servers would uh, access the database directly. This is not the case anymore. Uh, they don't even have the connection string to the collection database. They have a connection string to the collection service. And what's um, pretty cool is that you can scale this service. You can install several instances. And, um, well, as far as I understand, the biggest uh, bottleneck is CPU. Um, when you decide what data to write, or when Cypher decides uh, what data to write to the collection database and in what form to write it, it consumes CPU, and now um, this can be optimized by scaling out. And almost every single one of these new services can also be scaled out, um, except for the index worker. Okay, so let's quickly go through um, these services. XConnect search, um, it works with the XConnect index and is used to query indexed um, XDB data. Uh, reference data service, um, it accesses the reference data database on the bottom. And this database contains things like uh, goal definitions, campaign definitions, um, and uh, any row even a third, um, uh, or even your custom code that runs in your custom application can access reference data through this service. You don't have to run in Cypher context anymore to get this data. Um, automation operations um, is a service that, um, that splits out the um, marketing automation. Uh, into a separate role. So it um, also has its own database automation at the bottom. And uh, whenever some changes in automation states happen, they are processed by the automation engine service. And uh, since uh, the, the new marketing automation UI allows you to see reports, uh, for example, to see how many contacts are in each automation state. 
uh, you also get the automation reporting service, uh, which uh, provides this data. And the reporting service, um, it's the only one out of these uh, XConnect and XDB services that still runs on Sidecore, which is why it has <coughs> this red logo. Sorry, I'll get some water. So the reporting service stayed more or less the same as it was in Sidecore 8. It provides data that is stored in the reporting database in, aggre in uh, aggregated form. And uh, your content management servers uh, will call the reporting service um, from the reporting UIs. Uh, okay, and I'm sure most of you have heard of Sidecore installation framework. That framework allows you to install all of these services um, much easier than you would have to do it manually. So this new infrastructure is more complex for sure, but it's more flexible and uh, more performant than it used to be, and it's a big step forward. Okay, in the next part, I am going to talk about concurrency control. This is related to my last year's presentation, where I described different um, types of contacts, APIs. And um, yeah, I'll also compare the APIs at the end. Okay, so across Sidecore, Concurrency control stayed more or less the same, um, except when it comes to XConnect entities. <clears throat> uh, one example would be um, the processing servers. They still um, store uh, the work they need to do in processing pools. Uh, they use a bit different logic, but the concept is the same. Um, and most of the things stayed similar, but for XConnect entities, it's uh, very different. So um, there are two models for concurrency control in general. There's pessimistic and optimistic concurrency. Why do we need these two models? Let's take uh, an example. Let's say we have data x stored in some yeah, data cell. We have a thread one that reads uh, this data. Then we have another thread. It also reads this data. <coughs> After that, thread one, uh, based on the, data, on the value it read, uh, it decides to overwrite x with y. And thread two decides to overwrite it with Z. Well, is this um, a good scenario? Without any concurrency control, uh, it leads to unpredictable results. Uh, this is the classic race condition uh, scenario. Uh, of course, the problem is that you cannot predict which thread runs first, which all them reads and writes data first. So you don't know what you end up with. And this is um, something you know. This is a situation you don't want to be in when you write software. OK, so how can we solve this? There are two solutions. And in pessimistic concurrency, um, every thread will attempt to walk the resource somehow. Uh, in this example, uh, thread one will acquire the lock, and thread two will not be able to acquire the lock. 
This will mean that thread one has exclusive access uh, to this data. It can read it, it can write to it, and only after it's finished, uh, only then thread two uh, can, um, can work with this data. Uh, so when thread two cannot acquire the log, um, it can either wait um, if it knows when the log expires or yeah, it can find some other purpose in life. <clears throat> and uh, the other concurrency control approach is optimistic concurrency. And in this scenario, both threads will uh, successfully read X and they will both be able to write X without acquiring any locks. The difference is before, uh, before the write operation, every thread will have to validate that the data is still in the same form as it, um, it used to be when they read it. Uh, so in this scenario, thread one uh, will first validate that X is still X, and then it will override it with Y. But thread two, um, it will validate, or it will attempt to validate X, and it will see that X is no longer X. So it will have a decision to make either to uh, not perform the operation or to somehow merge data. So it will have access to the new value of the data and it may or may not overwrite it depending on, on the logic in this thread. So these are the two models. And Cypher 8 used the first model. Uh, this is um, a slide I, I showed last year. This is how it was in Sidecore 8. Um, let's imagine that you have a contact in the database that has two interactions already and there are no live sessions. And when a live session starts for this contact, uh, the contact will be locked in the collection database, which is indicated by it being read. Uh, it will be loaded into the shared session database. And um, after the session start, when the first request is served, the contact will also be locked in the shared session database. And it will be used in a page request after the page request ends it will be unlocked in the shared session database, and when the session ends, it will be saved and unlocked in the collection database. So this is how it used to be in Sidecore 8. It's not like this anymore. Uh, as you can see, from session start uh, to session end, the contact is locked in the collection database. Uh, this brought some challenges in the past, and here are those challenges. Every data client had to know how to handle <coughs> locked contacts. Um, well, this was a problem for some developers, if you judge by the amount of questions on Stack Exchange, uh, and understandably so. Uh, let's say uh, a contact is locked by a live, ses uh, live session, and <coughs> you have a <coughs> background process. Excuse me. <coughs> background process uh, that tries to modify the contact. Well, it cannot. It just has to postpone the operation. Uh, you have no choice. And, okay, another problem was that you had four different APIs for working with contacts, uh, which changed somewhat. Uh, okay, and uh, it would have been nice if you, if you are in this situation when a 
the contact you want to modify is locked. If you are able to hand over this update operation to the lock holder, and this was also not available out of the box. Uh, there are some solutions to this, but yeah, you had to work your way through this. And the last challenge was that the whole contact was locked. Every contact has um, facets, and those facets are mostly completely unrelated to each other. If you have a uh, contact's personal information, um, like their home address, and you have another piece of data, like their flight bookings or something, uh, why should um, a process that only needs the personal information, why should it log the whole contact? That doesn't make much sense, right? Because those pieces of data they are independent, so they should be changed independently. Uh, this was not possible, and it is possible in Cycle 9. So first of all, <coughs> there are no locks anymore. Uh, Cycle 9 uses the optimistic concurrency control model. Um, you can read any contact data at any time. You can write data at any time. You will not um, run into those situations, as I showed before. Uh, this is based on concurrency tokens. This is a mechanism for controlling concurrency optimistically. And another improvement is uh, the fine-grained concurrency control. You can change uh, contact data, and you can also request contact data um, separately. Uh, you don't have to uh, work with the whole contact. You can work with its core data. You can work with its facets one at a time separately. Uh, and same goes for interactions and device profiles. Uh, each of these entities also have uh, their own facets that you can also work with uh, independently of their other facets. Uh, okay, how do concurrency tokens work? This is a screenshot from, from the collection database um, from a table that stores facets. Uh, you can see four facets in two different contacts here. And each facet um, has some concurrency token associated with it. And this concurrency token is, um, well, it indicates a, a certain state of the facet. Um, okay, maybe this diagram makes it a bit clearer. It's the same diagram as uh, I showed in the previous slide, but uh, specific for Cycron. So <clears throat> let's say thread one uh, reads facet, and it doesn't only read <coughs> this facet. It also reads the concurrency token that is currently associated with this facet. <coughs> and when thread one decides to update the facet, it first validates that concurrency token stayed the same, and only in this case uh, will it successfully update the facet. And thread two, uh, in this scenario, it will fail to update the facet because it will already be updated by thread one. Concurrency token will be changed, and thread two um, check will fail. Uh, but the thread two will have an option to um, to merge um, it's uh, the data it wants to write with the updated data. So let's see a code sample. Well, this is <coughs> very simplified, but somehow via the XConnect API you can get a contact. It's 
easy, but it's irrelevant to my point. So let's say you have a contact that you got from XConnect. Uh, you set a facet on this contact, and then you submit your changes. Uh, in most cases, you will just expect that it um, succeeds. Uh, you don't have any problems. But you should be prepared. You should be prepared for exceptions. In case of conflicts, um, XConnect client API will throw XDB execution exception. And you will be able to iterate through all failed operations and find the ones that resulted in, in a conflict. And again, this conflict is determined based on the concurrency token. So for every failed operation, you can decide what you want to do. You may want to merge uh, your change with the conflict in, uh, conflict in change and submit your changes. Or you can just drop it. You, you don't have to do updates if, uh, yeah, if there was a new update to your facet. Okay, so we are cautious here, right? Uh, we try to perform an operation, we catch an exception, and if it fails, we do the update again. But can it fail in the catch block? Can it fail when you submit the second time? Obviously it can. What if uh, there are many, pro uh, many processes or threads uh, that try to update the same facets for some weird reason? Uh, you will fail uh, even, even when you're cautious. So you need to be more cautious. Uh, and how do you handle this? Right? Uh, do you nest like 10 different try-catch blocks? What do you do? Well, actually, I don't think XConnect provides a good way um, out of the box to solve it. Uh, but it would be great if there was a method like smart submit, uh, where you could uh, where you could uh, provide separate logic, one piece of logic for updating um, the contacts initially, and another piece of logic to merge. Uh, in case of a failure, in case of a conflict, and provides an amount of retries. Um, this is not available out of the box, but uh, you can write your own extension methods. And I also wrote one, uh, which I'm going to publish uh, on my blog in the coming days. Uh, but yeah, you have to be cognizant of of the, of the way uh, conflicts are handled in XConnect. Otherwise, you can run into problems. Okay, how has your life changed between Sidecore 8 and Sidecore 9? In Sidecore 8, when you were going to change a contact, you had to lock it first. If it was locked by somebody else, you had to postpone your work, go have lunch, um, and basically, you're living in a Microsoft Source Safe world. Does anyone remember Microsoft Source Safe? It was a, an old source control system by Microsoft, and when you worked with a file, you had to check it out, and nobody else could work with that file. So if you checked it out, uh, left up, uh, yeah, at 6 o'clock in the evening, and you got sick the next day, your colleagues will just, yeah, <laughs> they would want to kill you because they could not work with the file. And this was similar with contacts and contact, contact locks um, in Sidecore 8. In Sidecore 9, uh, you'll never be in a situation where you cannot write data. But you need to be ready to handle conflicts when you submit changes. And you need to be ready to handle them recursively. So now you submit changes, you merge, basically you're living a git life these days. 
yeah, that's, uh, that's the major change. And I mentioned that there were four contact APIs in Sitecore 8. So what happened to those APIs? Uh, contact Manager and Contact Repository, they're still there, they exist, but the data operations um, are done differently. They are just proxy to XConnect APIs, which means that you don't need um, or you shouldn't have to use those old APIs. You just use XConnect and it's client API from now on. Uh, shared session state manager remains, uh, but you shouldn't need it. Um, in the past, uh, since uh, contacts were locked, um, you could run into situations where you had to check uh, for a contact lock in the collection database. If it's locked, you could try to get a lock from the shared session state if you were on the same cluster as the lock holder. And so otherwise, you could check in the tracker in case your request was currently serving uh, this contact. Um, so now you shouldn't have to do this because you can just use XConnect API. And even if you're on the same cluster, you don't have to care about that. You can just write to the database directly via the XConnect APIs. And there is tracker current contact, which is um, a remnant of the old API. And uh, why I say it's a remnant uh, is because it uses the old entities. It doesn't use XConnect uh, contact entities or facet entities. Um, and uh, on session end, these entities will be converted to XConnect models. And I think it's, uh, it might be a good idea to use XConnect APIs uh, as much as you can. You still have access to all the APIs, but there shouldn't be a reason to use them. Okay, so this concludes my presentation. Thank you. In case you have any questions, you can ask them. And what is your question? <laughs> method in the XConnect API, you could provide separate logic for updates and for conflict resolutions. So in this second um, lambda expression called merge, uh, you'll be able to specify any business logic you would want. And as I said, it, it, well, I will publish a method that works like this on my blog, but um, it's not very complex. Anyone can, can write such a method. Um, does this answer your question? Yeah, cool. Any other questions? All right, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs>